and we went in there on this small island, and of course I did everything wrong. Of course I did everything wrong and got arrested pretty quick by the Islamic government there for insulting Islam. They told me, you're going to go to trial in two weeks and the prison sentence is 10 years and you're not allowed to speak because you're not a Muslim and anyone that can defend you has to be a Muslim, which no Muslim would do. So I ended up going to that trial by myself on this island. My wife and kids are on the island too. They could not leave. This is Where You're From, a podcast for those who believe it's important to stop and listen before we speak. Join us as we ask another Christian thought leader where you're from and discover how their life experiences and expertise, even if we may disagree with something they say, offer us an important perspective that's worth thinking about. Hey, y'all, this is Rasul Berry. Thanks for joining me again on Where You're From. This week, we are talking with Jamie Winship, one of the co-founders of Identity Exchange. Jamie is legit. From inviting gang leaders to stay in his home to being arrested in Indonesia, he's been in some crazy situations. But in all that, he has seen God work through him to bring peace and reconciliation in dangerous, high-conflict areas. Stay tuned for some wild stories. If you want to find out more about Jamie Winship and Identity Exchange, check out the show notes or visit our website at whereyou'refrom.org. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Now let's jump into our conversation with Jamie Winship as I ask him, where are you from? Born and raised in Washington, D.C. And then early part of my life was in subsidized housing. And then just slowly, as my dad was able to get jobs, we moved one mile out of the city. And until when I was in high school, we were out in the Loudoun County area. So my whole life was between wow. Washington, D.C., through Arlington, through Fairfax County, out eventually into Loudoun. You know, you mentioned subsidized housing. Did you know growing up that there were financial challenges or like, what do you remember about that period of your life? I remember very clearly the racial separation in the neighborhood, for mm-hmm. sure. And it produced quite a bit of violence. Not so much about the economic situation, mm-hmm. I knew we ate a lot of oatmeal, like a lot of oatmeal, and I, to this day, can't stand oatmeal, but, you know, it was okay. We didn't feel, like, deprived or anything. There were five kids Mm. piled in a bedroom and that kind of thing, but Mm. mostly I was aware of the conflict more than anything else, just the constant conflict, and not just from the area, but in my own family. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, my dad, early in his life, he wanted to be a professional dancer when he was young, like first grade, second grade. He wanted to be a professional dancer. And so he and his younger sister were in dance classes together, and he was absolutely the joy of his life. And then at the end of second grade, his parents sent him to military school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he had no idea what was happening to him. He got put on a train by himself oh my gosh. with a military person from the school and sent to school. His parents didn't go with him. He said it was terrible, and he made it through the first part of second grade all the way through to Christmas, sent him back home on the train. He thought, okay, well, that's over with. And then January 3rd, they put him back on the train, and he realizes, wow, this is going to be the rest of my life. And that probably broke his heart more than anything And so he spent the rest of his life in the military, bitter, frustrated, very much believing that in life, boy, life is you're on your own and you better learn to fight and you better learn to stand up for yourself. So those are the kind of ideals he really wanted us to get is you better learn to fight and you better learn to be by yourself and there's no one really to depend on. So he's pretty dark in that regard. And then he had to take a job eventually with a big company that he didn't want to take, but he had to pay the bills. And so all of his entire working life was just to eventually one day get out of it. And he would tell us all the time, never sell your soul just to make money. Never do it. Stay true to who you are. So he was never happy. Mm. He always saw life as a big disappointment. He just got darker and darker and darker and darker until he met Christ, which is after I was in college. Wow. 
That sounds tough. And, and it's yeah. also a reminder of, like you said, that context that you have now. I'm sure you didn't have that when you were 12 and experienced right. some of that darkness. But then you get older and you get some of that perspective. Right. And it kind of gives some nuance, I guess, to some of the difficulties you experience. Huh? Right. And then if you don't learn from the suffering, then it just becomes tragedy mm. and embitters. So fortunately, you know, I met the Lord when I was 17 and almost immediately it changed my perspective on my father as, wow, this is a person whose life has not gone the way they had hoped and dreamed. We actually have that in common. I also came to faith at 17. Mm. What were the circumstances behind your own faith journey? Well, I wanted to be a police officer, and that for sure came out of the idea of growing up in a place just filled with conflict. And so, for lots of different reasons, I came to view a police officer, a person that could bring stability and peace to a Mm. place. In my young mind, that's how I saw that. And I wanted to be in a role where I could go into conflict places and bring some kind of order for people being beaten around by the conflict. So, I was committed to that. And everything I did in my life from eighth grade forward was to get into the police academy. So, you know, I played football and all that stuff, not because I liked sports. I just wanted to be in shape. And going into my senior year, I had a severe leg injury during a wrestling tournament that sent me straight into the hospital. I mean, it was really a pretty nasty injury. And I was terrified that I wouldn't pass a police physical. And so when I woke up the next day after the surgery, the doctor was there and I said, can I pass a police physical? And he said, I don't know, I'm not sure, but you can't play sports anymore. And I was horrified and mad and bitter. And I felt like my dad, Mm -hmm. you know, I felt like, here we go. There was this amazing physical therapist there who said to me right when she first came into the room, she said, look, I'll work with you to heal the injury up to your body, but what's going to ruin you in life is your bitterness. Mm. And it just caught me really off guard. (laughs) Over five days, she's the one that really talked to me about forgiveness and peace and trust and Christ. And the wild thing is I cussed her out every day. I would never listen to her. I cussed her out until she would leave the room Mm. for five days. And she, to this day, has no idea that right when I was released from the hospital is the first time I really tried to meet God at a deep level. And my prayer was, God, can you teach me how to be a police officer like she's a nurse? Because she wasn't just a nurse. She wasn't just a physical therapist. There were lots of healthcare people in that hospital. Her identity was deeper than her vocation. And I knew that she was trying to heal me internally. And so she was a healer whose vocation was physical therapist. And I thought, police officers are a vocation. It's not an identity. How do I learn to bring an identity to my vocation like she was doing? And I realized even at 17, this woman's love is stronger than my anger. Ah. So that's why I figured it had something to do with God. Because she was talking about God. It was tied together, the forgiveness yeah, with the faith. Right. And in my neighborhood, in my family, man, if you cuss somebody out, the fists are coming out. With her, she would just receive it, walk away from it, and come back like it never happened. Mm. And I say to myself, she's way more powerful than I am. Wow. Her love is way more powerful than my hostility. I just had never seen it lived out like I've heard it talked about, but I had never seen it lived out like that. That is a powerful experience. Yeah. And so you mentioned that set you on a search. So Mm -hmm. where did your search take you? So I started looking for not Christians, but people like her, which were very different in my mind because my mom was very strict religious. And I knew this is different than that. And so when I got to university, I started looking around the campus and I would find these just rare standout individuals. I had one political philosophy for us. And I knew as soon as he started talking about political philosophy, he was like her. I knew it. And then I went with Campus Crusade on a traveling wrestling team because the coach was also that same kind of person. So then it was, how does this apply? Because the political philosophy professor and the wrestling coach and the nurse were demonstrating how to live out their faith in their, what we would say, vocation. And they were excellent at what they did. And so I always noticed that about them. And so then I started asking God, 
who am I then and what am I bringing to the world of law enforcement and how do I think about it? So that really affected me. I started praying a lot about it in criminal justice and all the classes you had to take. I was thinking about, you know, what does a spirit-filled, Christ-focused police officer look like? And then out into the police department with my FTO, my field training officer, who was the meanest person I've ever met in my life, but one of the best disciplers I've ever met. Mm. His whole thing was about me abiding with him. That's how he talked about it. He was a frustrated Irish Catholic guy. And his mom used to say a little prayer about abiding. And he used to say to me, look, you just need to abide with me. You just keep your mouth shut and abide with me and you'll learn. And so at the end of every 10-hour shift, he would say to me, are you sure you want to keep going? Because I don't think you're going to make it. But if you decide to come back and abide with me tomorrow at 7 a.m. And I would go in and tell my wife, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to make it. And then she would say, I'm pretty sure you are going to make it. By the next shift, I thought I was going to make it until the end of that shift. And I thought I wasn't going to make it. (laughs) After one year of that, I just realized the brilliance of what he was doing. Because we think we have to learn how to abide. (laughs) But you don't have to learn how to abide. You just have to make a decision to abide. And in the abiding, you learn. Mm. Abiding is just a choice. Wow. And so I think about that a lot in, when we talk about abiding in Christ. It's, it's not like, teach me how to abide. Abide is just a decision to stand next to and listen mm. and stay with. It's like when Jesus says to Peter, are you going to leave too? And he goes, where am I going to go? You're the only one that has the words of life. I'm staying with you. So abiding just means the commitment to stay with. And in the staying with is where you learn everything, right? Mm. That's a fascinating story that the person that you said was one of the most mean people oh. you know would actually use the phrase abide with me yeah. as a way of, similar to your dad, kind of toughening you up, right? but also teaching this lesson oh. that almost each day that you put on this uniform, you have to make the choice That's right. to be here. And you have to make the choice that you don't know everything. The first time I got in the cruiser with him, he looked at me and he said, I just have one rule. You're going to be with me a year. You're not allowed to talk at all for one year. You keep your mouth shut for one year. He said, because if you're talking, that means I'm not talking. And if I'm not talking, that means you're not listening. And if you're not listening, that means you're not learning anything. So keep your mouth shut and listen for one year. Hmm. That's abiding. (laughs) That was how we began. But I thought that is some of the smartest advice, even in prayer. The secret to prayer is listening right? The secret to prayer is hearing God, not telling God stuff, but listening to God. And abiding is about listening and learning in order that you can turn and give it away later. Okay. So, you're living in this new training experience, it seems. And so, then there's the idea between faith and vocation. Are you seeing that lived out? Yeah. You know, the harsh reality of my squad, and I loved my squad, I realized very quickly that they're no different than the people we're interacting with on the street, right? We wrestle with substance abuse. There was all kinds of domestic violence between people on the squad. Three of them got arrested my first year by the FBI for different felonies on the job. You know, it's just like people are people. And just because you wear a uniform or call yourself something doesn't transform who you are. Your identity is not that uniform. And so when I got cut loose, my FTO said, you've done the training. Well done. You're on your own now. So when I went out on my own, I started asking God, can you show me another way to think about policing that I don't know, that the police academy didn't teach because they wouldn't know how to teach it. Is there another way of thinking about law enforcement? And so that was my prayer. So I figured out, okay, God, it's not show me a better way. It's teach me how to know what to do in situations the way Jesus knows what to do. And wow, that made a difference. And so I would be in these cases and I would just say to the Lord, what do you want me to know about this that I don't know? And then what do you want me to do? Mm. And I would have these ideas (laughs) come into my mind, like, here's something you ought to try, or why don't you think about this? And I would just write them down in a notebook and then I would try them. Hmm. Like that simple. Can you give me an example of that difference? Yeah, because later on I was interviewed by the CIA on this whole thing and they would just pull out a case and they'd say like, how did you get the drugs to stop in this neighborhood without, you, you didn't arrest anyone. And I said, yeah. So what I did was I found the main gang leader in the neighborhood 
And I asked him if he would come stay at my house for the weekend. <laughs> and he agreed. And he came and stayed at our house for the weekend. And he came to faith. And then he went back into his gang as the leader. He didn't change his position as the leader of the gang. He changed how he led the gang. This is how Jesus operates. Wow. Right? And so he never gave up his position as gang leader. He was a leader. That was his identity. The false part of it was that he was a gang leader, mm -hmm. right? And so once he understood he's a leader in the way that Jesus would call him a leader, then Jesus was like, lead like that. And he started to lead his guys like that, and the crime just went down. Mm. Wow. I, See, I mean, we, don't, we don't do that stuff. That's not what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? As he said to me later, he said, you typically Christians just pull us out of our gang and put us in another, a Christian gang. <laughs> It's like, it's no different. Just leave us like Jesus would leave people where they were when they meet him. And Paul says it in Corinthians, let each person remain in the place where they are when God found them, mm. because they're the ones that can influence. I would have loved to see the faces of the Asians when you shared that story. <laughs> I told him, I told him when he asked me, I said, you're not going to like my process. And he said, I don't care. What we're looking at is the result. Mm. I mean, obviously you can't initiate when someone converts or puts right. their faith in Christ. But the bigger picture is you even approached him as a human, yes. right? With uh, understanding that there needed to be mentorship in his life and guidance. And then that ultimately right. that it's all based on the person and work of Christ. But even just approaching it with a sense of empathy and compassion right. and not just as a oppositional force exactly. is in and of itself kind of revolutionary for yes. how we think right. about things. And so, with that gang guy, even when I say gang leader, I'm calling him what the world calls him, right? Yeah. But all I wanted him to know was, what does God call you? I'm pretty sure he doesn't call you the leader of the bloods. I'm pretty sure he doesn't call you that. Mm. But I'm going to teach you how to know what God calls you, if you're willing. And then what he thought was hilarious was he said, are you telling me that God is sending my worst enemy to me to show me that he loves me? And I said, that's exactly how he works. Mm. Do you know why God tells us to love our enemy? Because they're not really your enemy. That's why. Mm. You only have one enemy, and that's Satan. That's the liar. All the other people you think are your enemies, not true. Wow. So let's rewind. When did you meet <laughs> your wife? I met her in university. She's Jewish, and she had never heard anything about the New Testament or anything. So I was the first one ever to share the gospel with her. So that's how we initially met. That started off very rocky, my gospel presentation, because I never met a Jewish person before. So you just approached her. You didn't know who she was. No, someone who had recently come to faith introduced me to her and said to her, you need to listen to what this guy's talking about, because it's really impacted me. And then that person just left. <laughs> And so it was me and my roommate and her, and her name's Donna. And she goes, what are they talking about? And I just kind of launched into the four laws with her. Nice. And I said, you're sinful and separated from God and cannot know and understand. And man, she went off on me. She said, I'm a Jewish person. We are the chosen people. We have never been separated from God. You Christians need Jesus crutch. We do not need it. And she stormed out. She was so mad. So I was like, well, there must be another way to talk to her. Yeah. And just a little backstory. I also was on staff with Crew for about 20 years. So oh, I'm wow. very familiar okay. with the four spiritual laws. But yeah. for those who aren't, maybe we should probably yeah. give a little review. Do you want to do it? <laughs> yeah. Well, so the, that's how we were trained, you know, right. if you're in crusade. And so it's just a little booklet called the four spiritual laws. And it just starts with God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Law two, but you're sinful and separated and cannot know and experience God's love and plan for your life. And then it goes into Jesus as the one who can reconcile us back to God. Basically, right? Is that right? And then four is you can personally make the decision to receive Christ as your Savior right. Lord and then right. have your sins forgiven be in relationship with God and that yeah. life that he has for you. So you kind of do the booklet. And again, especially when you're new to the whole experience, it can be pretty robotic and lack yeah. any kind of <laughs> emotional right. or social yeah. context. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so yeah, it takes sure. you a while to kind of get to a point of being able to be a bit more sophisticated yeah, exactly. with the approach. But So you were new and raw and you just kind of jump right in <laughs> threw it right at her and she said no way i'm not doing that so how did the conversation even get to a place where that wasn't the end of the situation it's just a yeah. rant and then that's done well first it started by me apologizing to her which is mm. always a good thing to do i apologized to her that i didn't take time to ask her who she was or what her mm. background it was more a performance thing on my part 
And then I said, as a Jewish person, do you know the Torah? And she said, I do. I was raised in it. And so I said, when you read like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, like what do those mean to you? And then she started to engage and she said, I mean, I don't really know. That's not how we read it. It's much like a Muslim reads the Quran. And so I said, well, you know, we would say that this is fulfilled in the Gospels and super intriguing to her. And she went into her rabbi and asked him about it. Hmm. And he didn't give her a satisfactory answer. She was very frustrated with her rabbi. And she said, why couldn't this be Jesus? And she was very dissatisfied with his answer. So she came back to me and she said, I have three questions. One is, as Jews, we don't sacrifice anymore. And I don't know what to do with my shame. Mm. What does Jesus do with shame? Which I was like, whoa. Hmm. And then she said, also in Judaism, we don't have heaven or hell. So how do you understand what happens when you die and tell me why you understand it that way? And third, she said, I was born into a very wealthy, privileged family. What am I supposed to do with that? Because I feel guilty. We're not going to do anything with it except be rich and privileged. So what would I do with my life if I was a follower of Jesus? Wow. <laughs> that was the level of question she had. I mean, no, just the heavy hitters, <laughs> just, you know, all the way yeah. through. That is fascinating. But what's really fascinating that we've learned over the years is that's the kind of questions most people have at a deep level if you ever let them get to it. Mm. Especially the issue of why am I here? What am I doing here? You know, I feel like I don't love how things are going, but I don't know an alternative to it. So it was a couple of years for her before she made the decision that she was going to be a follower of Christ. It was a very careful, slow decision for her. But when she decided, wow, she just went after it with everything that she has and told me she wanted to spend her life helping Jewish people, but anyone understand the reality of Christ. Wow. So I am imagining that life didn't get simpler for her at home after that decision and definitely kind of bringing you into the mix. So tell us a little bit about that connection. Yeah, well, so she came to faith really very much apart from me. We lived in different cities. And later on, you know, when we started talking seriously relationally, I went to her father and I asked his permission if I could date her. Because I knew that this is all asking God, what do you want me to know first? And then what do you want me to do? And this impression, like, make sure you respect her dad the whole way through this. And so I went to her dad's law offices and introduced myself. And I said, I would love permission to date your daughter. And I was 21. So was my wife. And he looked at me and he said, you drove five hours to ask my permission to date my daughter. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, why? And I said, because I want you to know that I respect your opinion of who I am and what I do. And I respect your daughter. He goes, my own sons wouldn't do this to me. Mm. And so later when I asked him if I could marry her, he said, would you convert to Judaism? And I said, no. We talked through that. And I told her, I'm not going to marry her until you say yes. He said, what if I never say yes? And I said, well, I'll ask you until you pass away. (laughs) And I said, then I'll just marry her. He thought that was the funniest thing. (laughs) But he said to me, the reason I'm going to say yes to this and give you my blessing is just because of the honor you've shared me through this whole thing. But he really struggled with her in the first 10 years of our marriage. We were forbidden to talk about our faith. And it wasn't until we had been living in the Muslim world that her dad said to me one time, he said, I'm going to tell you something I do. When I'm at the Jewish men's club, I brag about my Jewish daughter who lives and works in the Muslim world, about how courageous she is and about how she loves her enemy. He goes, I brag about her. Mm. I don't know any Jewish person that lives like that. That's beautiful. And I'm curious about how did that transition to that part of the world happen? Yeah, so that was the interview with the CIA. I had been a police officer for five years, and they called me in. And they wanted to know what I was doing on the job and how I was doing it. And I explained different cases that he picks out. And he finally says, okay, listen, can you do this overseas? Can you do this among an Islamic population? I said, what's the difference between an Islamic person and the people I'm working with right here? See, one of your problems is that you think they're different than us. They're not. They're people. Mm -hmm. I said, if they're human beings, what I do will work with them. And he said, okay, let me give you a real life scenario that we're dealing with. And he tells me this whole scenario and he says, we cannot figure out what to do. We've already lost one agent. If we put you in this scenario, can you tell me right now what you would do? And I just asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to know about the scenario? And I just waited 60 seconds. I had an idea. 
And I said, here's what I would do. And I told him, and he said, you have a job. Wow. We're offering you a job right now on the spot. Do you take it? And he wrote down the salary and everything slid it across the table to me. I said, yep, I'll take it. And so that, like you're just going along in life, but this is what the scriptures are talking about. And on this Tuesday night, everything goes to the next level. It's like God saying to the Israelites, consecrate yourselves today because tomorrow we're doing a new thing. I said, I will take the challenge of what you're doing because I feel like God's inviting me into it. So that's what caused us to leave the police department and start looking overseas. When we come back, we'll find out where God takes Jamie and his family and how he quickly wound up in court facing a 10 year prison sentence. That's coming up next on Where You're From. This episode is brought to you by Church Salary. Coming up with a reasonable salary range for church staff has never been easy. There are so many details to consider before setting compensation for church staff, and you're probably asking yourself questions like, are we paying too little or too much? What benefits do we offer employees? What's a reasonable housing allowance? Church Salary believes that offering competitive and fair compensation helps keep people in ministry. Using the expansive, church-specific compensation database and powerful salary calculator tool, you can also make better compensation decisions so your staff can focus on their ministries. Start with Church Salary's annual membership today to run unlimited customized reports and get access to our member-only content. Ready to start making better compensation decisions? Get started at churchsalary.com. Hey y'all, before we get back to our conversation with Jamie Winship, I want to share a quick teaser from our next episode with Nona Jones. This is where you're from. In the fifth grade, you know, between fifth and sixth, you're making the leap from elementary to middle school. Students were going on one or two paths. Either A, they were going into middle school just as like, you know, regular students, or B, if they had a lot of potential, they were going in as advanced students. And my, my teacher, my fifth grade teacher was like, you know, you are not advanced material. You know, you will not be advanced material. You are always making trouble. And I was like, man, so the year before I had made these, you know, all A's. And then it was in the fifth grade. She was like, you know, you're never going to mount to anything. So it was like a 180. So I get to middle school and, you know, I was living down to her words. I was like, well, if I'm not going to be anything, what's the point of trying? I hope you'll join us again. Now let's jump back into our conversation with Jamie Winship. You know, the contrast between the answer to that question and what I thought the answer was going to be could not be further. (laughs) I assumed that you were involved in some type of mission agency and decided to go that. But in a sense, you were dispatched and even commissioned, Yeah, but just in a completely different way. Right. So let me just say something about that because that's super important. And I love helping people understand this. We went to a fantastic missions church. I mean, they were all about missions. And my wife would say, you know, during the missions conference at the church, she'd always say, let's go forward. We're both interested in missions. Let's go forward to the missions conference. And I would say to her, you go forward to the missions conference When God invites me, he will invite me in my own identity. Mm. And he will invite me in the way that he knows he made my heart to respond. And I'm pretty sure it won't be in a missions conference. But for her, it was so great. And so my mission call was from the CIA. Of course it would be. And so I tell people, when God calls you, he'll call you in the identity that he gave you, not in the identity someone's trying to put on you out of guilt or whatever. No, my whole life he's called me to be involved in law enforcement at some level. And so I knew that was his invitation. The word that comes to mind is holistic. Right. When I think of the Hebrew word shalom. Yes. You know, in that sense of a wholeness, a peace. It sounds like what you're saying is that we can narrow our options and our perspective of what God is doing because we're just looking at it in this very particular type of way. Exactly. When God is like, no, I want the whole thing. It's all of you. That's right. Yeah. So you get over there. Tell us a little bit about that adjustment. I mean, that's a pretty major shift. Right. So I told the CIA this. I said, the worst thing I could do is be actually employed by you. That's the mistake you keep making. This particular group that you're trying to infiltrate, they have to be transformed by Jesus. That's what has to happen. 
I'm willing to go in there and be a part of God doing that. But if they're transformed by Christ and they find out it's a CIA operation, it pollutes the name of Jesus. And then Jesus will be associated with U.S. foreign policy as an empire building. And that will destroy the purity of Christ. And so he didn't fully understand that. So he said to me, you mean you're going to do the job that we're asking you to do, but you're not going to let us pay you or anything for it. And I said, exactly. That's exactly right. I'm taking the challenge because I think God is using you to invite me into the challenge, but he doesn't want me with you. So they're like, okay, (laughs) fine. And so I had to go to grad school, which I did. And then we took three years to develop a new strategy. And this is all prayer reading scriptures, prayer, asking the Lord, okay, to help us to understand how would you go inside this group and watching Jesus and Paul and the early church infiltrate the world. What were they doing? Jesus took people and basically took over the entire Roman Empire with no army. (laughs) And so it can be done. Anyway, we went to work. I got the Muslim government to employ me, which was like Moses getting the Egyptians to finance the exodus. And we went in there (laughs) on this small island. And of course, I did everything wrong. Of course, I did everything wrong and got arrested pretty quick by the Islamic government there for insulting Islam. They told me, you're going to go to trial in two weeks and the prison sentence is 10 years. And you're not allowed to speak because you're not a Muslim. And anyone that can defend you has to be a Muslim, which no Muslim would do. So I ended up going to that trial by myself on this island. My wife and kids were on the island, too. They could not leave. And so this was the first next level lesson God wanted to teach me, (laughs) that you can be completely alone, 10,000 miles away from anyone you know, with no advocate at all, facing prison, and God could run the whole thing (laughs) with nobody else there. And he had to teach me not to be afraid of this kind of scenario. The only way you can learn not to be afraid of something is for God to take you through the fear of it. Mm. That's the only way. And so he had to show me, I don't want you to be afraid of being arrested and put on trial in a Muslim country. And the only way I can teach you how to do that is let's do it. (laughs) So that's what happened. Okay. Well, I know you're not going to end the story there because I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I go to the trial and it's all in Indonesian and There's three clerics and there's the head of the university that we worked in. So they read the charges and the charges that I demean the Quran and I didn't demean the Quran. But what they said, I said, I did say. And I was teaching research methodology and one of my students was asking me, can the Quran be the only source I use for my Ph.D.? And I said, no. And he said, why not? Is it not authoritative? And I said, that's not the point. You got to have multiple sources. And then they just took it as I was saying the Quran's not authoritative. So that charge was that I insulted the Quran. So I did say it. I wasn't denying that I said it. So I'm in the courtroom and they read the charge and I'm like, shoot, I did say that. And so I'm asking the Lord, what do you want me to know about what's happening here? I think I can survive 10 years in prison. I'm more concerned about my Jewish wife and kids being on this island for 10 years while I'm not there. More than any of that, I want to know what you want me to know. That's what's valuable. It's it's not like, how do I avoid all this? It's what do you want me to know? And and then what do you want me to do? And so I'm just sitting there and that's going through my mind. And they read the charges. They say, anyone want to speak in, you know, defense of this guy? And it's quiet. But then this person comes walking in. And so only Muslims are allowed in this whole thing. So whoever he is, is a Muslim. He walks in, he comes to the front. In English, he says, I want to speak never seen this guy before. I know he doesn't have anything to do with the university I'm at. I know he's not even on this island. So he came from somewhere else. But he's a Muslim. He's wearing the uniform of a university professor. They give him permission to speak. So he says, you all know who I am. They all nod that they know who he is. So he's got some kind of authority. And he said, I just want to say one thing and then I'll let you go on with these proceedings. He said, I just graduated from University of Arizona State with a PhD in linguistics. And he said, I just want to tell you about the two guys that I met there who are my lifelong friends. Because when I got there, I knew I was going to fail. And he said, if you fail when you're sent by the government of Indonesia on a full scholarship, you're an embarrassment to the country and you will never work again. He's looking around and everyone in the courtroom knows that's a fact. And he said, and I knew I was going to fail. I'm thinking while he's saying this, no Muslim would come in here and admit that. So this guy is a Muslim, but he's a different kind of Muslim because he's letting his shame show. 
which is really unusual. So he goes, but I want to tell you about the two guys that came to help me. These two American students came to help me. And they said, we're here to help you pass the PhD program. We will do anything to help you. Their wives helped my wife. He said they were never too tired, never too busy. He goes, and actually in the end of the program, I finished above both of them because they kept lifting me above them. And he said, while I was with them for three years, he said, they invited me to a Wednesday night meeting. And I went to that Wednesday night meeting and it was a Bible study. And I went to that Bible study every Wednesday night for three years with these two men. He goes, now, is anyone in this courtroom saying I'm not a good Muslim because I went to a Bible study for three years with these two guys? Is anyone accusing me of being a bad Muslim for doing that? And he looks around. Nobody says a word. He goes, here's the weird thing about those guys. They're my enemies. He goes, I'm a Muslim. They're Christians, and yet, why would they help me? Maybe they think that we're evil in the world. Islam's evil in the world. No matter what they thought about me, they loved me. He said, and we know we're the greater religion. He's talking to the Muslims, the clerics. He goes, we know Islam's the greater religion. Christianity's second to us. Yet these secondary believers sacrifice everything for me. He goes, now we have a Christian, he points to me, in our country. Wow. He's teaching us. And he makes a mistake. He says something he probably shouldn't have said. Now, he goes, we're the greater faith. The lesser faith Christians sacrifice for me to succeed. This guy makes one mistake in our country, and we, the greater faith, are going to put him in prison for 10 years. I think that's wrong, and I'm embarrassed by this. So you go ahead and make whatever decision you want, but I'm not going to have any part of this. And he walks. He just leaves. And the clerics look at me and go, all the charges are dropped. Everything's dismissed. You're free to go. So I go outside and the guy, he's standing out there and I thought it was an angel or something, you know, but he's smoking a cigarette and I thought, nah, probably not an angel. (laughs) And he tells me his name and he said, you know, the guy that charged you, the big Islamic guy was killed yesterday in a car accident. He's the lead Muslim in the region we were in, was killed in the car accident. He goes, I'm the new lead Muslim here in this whole region, not this side, everywhere here. He goes, I've only been in this position 24 hours. I read about this case coming up, and I flew here to pay back my two friends, my two Christian friends at Arizona State University. Mm. He goes, let me tell you something. He said, I know you're here because Jesus invited you to be here. He said, but when you open your mouth to talk to my people... You better learn another way to say it because most of what you say is just offending them. He said, you better learn a way to say it that they can hear it and show respect to them. He said, because if you don't do that, they're going to kill you. And it was the same thing my wife said to me the first time I shared the four laws with Mm. her. The exact same thing. She's like, man, everything you just said just offended every part of who I am. You better come back and say this in a different way. And the Lord was reminding me, how many times am I going to teach you this lesson, Jamie? You need to, like Peter said, honor all people. Don't talk to people like they're less than you, like you love people more than they do. And so that made me committed to learning how to talk to my Muslim students and co-workers in the way that Jesus would talk to them. And that changed everything. My goodness. That's just an incredible story. So how long were you in Indonesia and what happened next? Yeah. So we spent 10 years in Indonesia working for the Indonesian government in the Ministry of Education. And then after that, we were sent to Baghdad, Iraq in 2003 and four, and then over to Jordan for a number of years, then into Israel for five years, and then back into the U.S. at the end of 2016. Wow. Wow. Quite the travel miles you logged. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. So you talk a lot about identity and help us understand like how these stories, these encounters, this question of what do you want me to know connects with this aspect of identity and how we can be tied into what it is that God wants for us to do wherever we may find ourselves, not just in a vocational ministry space, but anywhere. Right. When I was a police officer, I'd walk into a situation The people in the situation would look at me and they would form a view of my identity, right? They would say, oh, he's white, he's in a uniform, and then they would just assume these things about me and it would create separation between me and that person. And then I would look at them and do the same thing. Oh, they live in this neighborhood, oh, they're this race, you know, we all do it all the time. 
And it bothered me. It's like, what, why are we using these ways of identifying each other? And so I started looking at the scriptures. How does Jesus identify? When he's talking about people, does he call them Samaritans? Does he call them Gentiles? He doesn't even talk a lot about gender when he's talking to a person. So I was just observant of that. And then Mark chapter 8, like the high point of Mark 8 is Jesus asking Peter and the disciples, who do you say that I am? He's asking them the ultimate identity question. Who do you say I am? So the essence of the human is, I am who? Who am I? And how do we gain a sense of who I am? And if God knit us together in our mother's womb and we ask God, God, who do you say that I am? Not like you're a child of God. That's what he says to all of us. That's like me saying to my son, your son one and your son two and your son three. That's not an identity. The identity is I'm a uniquely made by God. He'll never make another me again. He's never made one before. I'm unique. Who am I then? Who is this? Yeah. So if I ask people, tell me who you are, they say things like, well, I'm a conservative or I'm a progressive. None of these are identity statements. Mm -hmm. They're team names. They're gang names. And they're just saying, this is the gang I'm in. This is the team I'm on. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking who you are. You. Your identity is your gift to the world. And most of us never know what it is. So when you start reading the scriptures, you start realizing how important identity is to God. Naming is so important to God all the way through the scriptures. I mean, all the way through. And so it's the question of true identity versus false identity. When we were talking to Muslims to try and get them to not be Muslim and be Christian, you know, to get them to convert was a disaster. But Jesus says to the Pharisees one time, he says, you are converting the Gentiles into Judaism and making them twice the sons of Satan than you are. He uses the word converting. Yeah. Convert means to switch from one system to another. What we want is spiritual transformation, to mm -hmm. switch from the false you to the true you. That's what Jesus is talking mm -hmm. about. Let me just drop in there because you've dropped mm -hmm. a lot of nuggets. One, you talk about the contrast, this really existential, ontological, just very at the core essence of who we are contrast between a false identity and our true identity. Yes. At our essence, that is what God is calling us into right. yes. in relationship with him. That our false identities consist of often what we do, you know, what right. we have or what people think about us. Yes. Right. So, like, what would you say is the alternative in terms of what a, a true identity is called? So, whatever God calls a person, he names us after himself, like we're his children. He names us after a name that he would call himself. That's how you stay inside the parameters of scripture and don't get weird and wacky about all this stuff. And so when I was working one day overseas, a guy, another mentor I had that was fantastic, he was watching me one day talk to these Muslim guys and he pulled me aside and he goes, you don't know who you are, do you? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you do not know who you are. By that time, I'd been working over there five years. I've been through seminary. I'm ordained. I've been through all of it. And this guy is telling me I don't know who I am. And I said, yes, I do. I know who I am. And he goes, no, you don't. And I said, how do you know? And he says, because you're imitating me. Mm. You're just imitating me and I'm already here and I'm not you. Do you want to be a cover band your whole life? Is that what you want to wow. be? And I'm telling you, in Christianity, that's what most of us are doing, is imitating some model of something we read in a book. He said, we need the real you, but we can't tell you who the real you is. Only you and God know who the real you are. So unless you tell us who the real you are, we don't know what to do with you. <laughs> so what happens is we just get put in slots and fill positions. Mm. I'm a believer. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. Okay, good slot them in this position, which might be counter to who you really are, the real you. Because yeah. those are just general names. And so they sent me to another guy. <laughs> this is all overseas. And I go to him and he says to me, let's just ask God what he calls you. He goes, haven't you ever done this? Haven't you ever just asked God to tell you who you are? And I said, no. So we just prayed together. And I just had this very clear sense when I prayed that God said, you're a warrior. And it just made me cry. So I had to confess, you know, yeah, wow, a lot of my life is just trying to prove I'm brave. And I cried. And he said, 
you don't have to prove that you're brave to me. I made you a warrior. What I want you to be is a warrior who's well, who's whole. Mm-hmm. Not fragmented and trying to prove things and, you know, win Muslims and all that. Just I just want you to be a warrior and understand what that means. And it was like this burden lifted off of me. And I could just be who God made me to be. Not trying to impress anybody. Not trying to measure myself against anybody. But just be. And when I did that, the fruit, it was already there. It just grew because out of abiding comes the fruit, right? Not out of the effort and all that. And so what I started doing with people, even with Muslims, I would say, tell me who you are. And they would say, we're Muslim. And I'm like, there's 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. That's not, can't be it. Who are you? I'm a Palestinian Muslim or I'm a Yemeni Muslim, like those millions. I'm asking you who you, this is, who is this distinct from everyone else on the planet that God made? And they would say, I don't know. I don't know. And I would say, no one knows except God, but God wants you to know who he made you to be. And when we started doing that with the Muslims, they started coming to faith in Jesus. Yeah. Let me ask you, because the way that, you know, you're describing this aspect of identity formation, which essentially is what discipleship is, right? It's, it's yes. that process of steeping ourselves in a new identity. Because now you're back in the States. When you survey the way that maybe the world, the media, or even the church talks about itself. How do you see it different? Because it sounds and feels very different about how we may talk about ourselves versus yeah. how we ought to in light of this identity transformation. Right. So when I invite someone to church, like I'm going to, hey, I want you to come to my church. What does that person hear me asking them to do? Do they hear me asking them into deep spiritual transformation to discover the depth of who they've always really ever been and can only fully know and experience in Christ? Nope. What they hear is, I'm a part of this team over here. We call ourselves Christians or evangelical or Baptist. or We're we're trying to make a bigger team. We need more players on our team. We would love for you to join our team. In order to join our team, here's the things you need to do. Once you join our team, we need you to produce for our team. Mm. And as long as you produce for our team, we're going to love you. God's going to love you. But here's how you need to produce. You need to witness. You need to pray. Like these are the measurement tools of how we're going to measure your performance on our team the whole time. Mm. That's to me what the church sounds like. What it should be is this very beautiful collection Paul describes it as a body. There's hands and feet and eyes. And that's not, we're not inviting people into that. It looks just like all the culture that you've already exposed to. We have a celebrity pastor. We have a celebrity singing group. It's like, it's not like what you would imagine Jesus is inviting people into. Jesus called to be with him, those he wanted to be with him in order that he could be with them, in order that he could send them out. Oh. With, 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 send. And so, Why do the disciples want to be with Jesus? Because he wants them to know who they really are. They identify that I'm a zealot. I'm a tax collector. I'm a Jew. No, you're not. I mean, you are, but that's not an identity. And then when Jesus is walking around, I'm a Samaritan woman. That is not what I knit together in your mother's womb. I did not make a Samaritan woman. I did not make that. I made your unique identity. And that's what I call you. And when Jesus introduces people, he doesn't say, here's a Samaritan woman that I create. He would never say that. He would call her the name that the shepherd calls his sheep and the sheep respond because he calls them by name. We say to people, if Jesus walked in this room and there were 10,000 people here, he would say one name and you would be the only one that stood up. Mm -hmm. That's how much he loves you. So what is that? That's the question. Got it. Okay. So before I get to what is that, let me... I don't know, push back or just maybe give you an opportunity to add some nuance to this idea. Because even in the context of John 4, like Jesus doesn't deny that she's a Samaritan woman. Not at all. You know, it's it's just that he takes her to a deeper level. I'm curious because I know even in the beginning, you talked about the racial tensions that Mm -hmm. existed in your neighborhood. And obviously, you've seen all over the world these kind of conflicts. What's a healthy way for someone to acknowledge the ethnicity or or gender or or, or class that they're in without it making an ultimate identity? Yeah. So that's a fantastic question. And of course, you know, everyone asks that. So it's like this very beautiful, unique identity 
for whatever reason, God appoints times and places and where we're born. For whatever reason, he put it inside this house, <laughs> right inside this neighborhood that I grew up in, all important, all valuable, but it's not my identity. This is my identity inside of a white male body that grew up in the circumstances. And then I look back at my life and where I grew up, I'm like, oh my gosh, you were training that the whole time. That's why I was born in a conflict zone. Mm. Where, would, where would this beautiful identity grow up to be the fullest of what God would have it be as a gift to the world? Mm. Right? Yeah. In this space, in right. this location. So you grew up in a Philadelphia mm -hmm. In the race that God, you know, formed you in, all incredibly invaluable and informative, but to that beautiful identity that's inside of that. Right. So just simply, if me and you were going to go talk to a particular group of people, just your DNA makes you more effective in certain places than me. Yeah. yeah. Right? And that's beautiful. But your identity is even more unique than that. Gotcha, gotcha. And you know what's ironic too is as we have this conversation, I don't know if you noticed my name, Rasul. My whole name yes, is I Rasul I wrote it Adin down. Akbar. Yeah. And I was born in a Muslim family and mm. I came to faith at 17. And the thing that was yeah. really interesting is that to this day, I get in an Uber and you know someone <laughs> notices my name because they see it because yeah. of their Uber and they go, hey, so, you know, yeah. you're a Muslim. So I actually know I follow Christ. I'm a pastor. And they go, how did that happen? And then yeah. I get an opportunity to you know, share my Beautiful. faith. I'm curious about if you see this connected when you talked about this sense of purpose, right? Mm -hmm. I think about Acts 17. Acts 17 is kind of this incredible training opportunity that we can look at when Paul is speaking at Mars Hill right. and he is addressing the people there and he starts with what they know and who they are, right? Yes. You know, I see that you have devotion and he gives them a compliment, you know, that you're very right. zealous and yes. and you even have the inscription yeah, yeah, to yeah, the unknown yeah. God. Right. And then he, he says, well, I'm going to present to you, you know, what is unknown. But then he, as he describes this God and he says that God doesn't need to be worshiped with anything from our human hands. And then he says in 26, and he's made of one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times appointed in the bounds of their habitation yes, that they should right. seek the Lord if they might feel after him, even though he's not far. Is right. that kind of what you're yes, getting at in terms exactly. of the connection between who we are, where God has placed us and yes. what that can mean? Absolutely. And your name is a great example of that. Rasul means messenger. Messenger. Yeah. yeah. And so like, that's awesome. That's incredible. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. If you and I went anywhere, the, just Rasul, how you look, where you were born, all, all hugely beneficial, right? All meaningful and in specific situations, even better. And so then the next question is in that, and this is where we go into the deeper identity is to say, Lord, you know, you had me born and formed in this Muslim context, in this family. What do you want me to know about that? What do you want me to know about it? And, and what do you want me to do with it? It's a gift. It's not something to be despised. It's a gift. It's something to be valued. How do I honor it? How do I give it as a gift to the world in terms of, you know, relationship to Christ? That's one question. However, if you and I were praying together and I was asking the Lord, Lord, at the deepest level, you know, Rasul's parents named him that. What do you call him? What do you call him? It's really interesting, the ideas and the things that go through people's minds. And I do this all the time with people that aren't from faith backgrounds. This is very moving to people because most humans do not have a sense of identity. And it's hurting and it's actually creating conflict. And our thing is like, you already have an identity. It's within you. God gave it to you because only God can create people. <laughs> and so who did he create? And, you know, I mean, if we had a lot of time to talk about this, we're particularly called into high conflict groups. And the fastest way to get through the conflict and tension at a table is to go deeper than the identities that are producing the conflicts in the room. God did not create identity to create conflict between people. God's identity brings reconciliation to people. What is your identity? 
Who has God created you to be? I hope you take some time to ask God that question and to see how your life and history have prepared you to be the person God has called you to be. This is where you're from. I'm Ross Berry, And remember, it's not just about where you're at. It's also about where you're from. This show was produced by Daniel Ryan Day, Ryan Clevenger, Mary Jo Clark, and Jade Gustafson, and was engineered by Gabrielle Boward and Kevin Burgess. Also want to thank Austin and Bobby for their help in supporting and promoting where you're from. Thanks, y'all. Where You're From is part of the Voices Collection from Our Daily Bread Ministries.